Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back, or welcome if you weren't in the morning session. We're having a panel of our speakers from this morning about humanitarian and open source software. I'm Kate Chapman. This is Chris Daly, Noel Taylor, and Michael Howden. Uh, I ha certainly have a series of questions for us to discuss, but first, since we skipped questions in the morning, does anyone have any questions for any of the speakers? <laughs> Just hold it about here and speak. Cheers. Uh, I keep hearing a lot about different kinds of uh, health tech programs and open source programs for developing, uh, or whatever the polite term is these days, countries. How do they all interact with each other? Uh, some of them seem to overlap. Some of them clearly piggyback on top of each other. Are there any formalized systems or formalized ways in which all these kinds of projects work? Does anyone want to um, it depends on the software. There's, one of the things that's happened is there's a lot of hackathons for good these days. I'm sure people have probably attended some of those. And some of the more obvious problems people keep solving over and over and over again. And so that's led to some innovation, but it also leads to a lot of duplication. So there's a lot of software that um, it's difficult even to choose what to use. but. With a lot of systems, by using standards and simply having open data when available, that helps them interact. Um, so Sahana, for example, uses OpenStreetMap. Um, Ushahidi, which is another well-known uh, piece of software, um, has an API and you can download data. It also uses OpenStreetMap. There's some systems, though, that just don't work together that well. Um, it, so it sort of depends on the purpose. Uh, we, we also see... Sometimes you end up with local forks that work very very well in one particular local environment as well. So it really depends on the software. I, I guess it's not really any different than most, a lot of open source. You know, people um, collaborate, but then sometimes they fork and go their own way for a reason that maybe makes sense to the developers, but not necessarily everyone else. Um, and sometimes leads to surprising improvements, but it, it really just depends on the individual project. Yeah, building what uh, Kate was saying, that's exactly one of the holes for Google um, with the MapMyRights Foundation as well. Uh, fortunately, though, technology um, is often used by some you know, NGOs or other groups as a wedge to get funding also. So they use that as a gateway to go to funders and say, well, we want to do this based on technology, we want to do a small project, um, and that leads Uh, some conflict there with regards to can we bring them onto the platform. And our argument is let us build the platform and the technology. You can build the front end so you still have a technology role, but it will frees up funding and time for you to focus on your core remit, which is helping the people in the field. Yeah, I'll just um, um, emphasise open data standards, sharing data as one of the things what Kate said. I think also with the hackathon thing, I think people come along to hackathons and say, hey, here's a problem that hasn't been solved. I'll write, write some code to solve that problem. And that code has already been written, but it's that, like, it's, that's not the problem. It's, it's getting the code out there. It's getting user feedback. It's looking at a, a sustainable solution, which, I mean, it's difficult to get that in a weekend hackathon with sort of spikes of surge effort. It's also difficult to get that in a single response. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. there? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, my name's Andrew Tridgell, and um, I'm uh, in this here listening in on this track because I'm interested in open source autopilots. Um, I'm the lead developer of an autopilot called IGPilot. And I know it, it falls in the class of technology that you know you mentioned in the talks earlier about it's complex technology. It may not necessarily be field ready. It might just get in the way. Sometimes the technology is too much for some of the operations you are. But I'm interested in what would it are there use cases where auto, open source autopilot technology might be useful 
um, in humanitarian cases in the future and what do you want to be done by the open source autopilot community to make ourselves more useful for humanitarian cases? So the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team we want we want to use drones and UAVs. We've done there's been some work not directly on our projects sort of to the side of them using completely proprietary systems which goes against our mission and goals as an organization. And honestly so far commercial companies have essentially bundled up an entire system and handed it over. Um, and and it's not to say that we're not used to setting up systems. We just have never had anyone with a particular desire to make sure it's all bundled together so that we could go use it in a field test or funding so that we could go do that as well. Um, I'm personally very interested. I'm on the board of advisors of the Humanitarian UAV Network, uh, primarily adver to advocate for open data more than anything else. Um, because HOT is a small organization, we're not necessarily going to fly UAVs in a crisis. We might do it in preparedness work, but we certainly want that information available. Um, so if, for us, it's maybe having a group or an individual interested in working on those problems and working with us. Uh, we definitely have people within our volunteer group that are experienced with use of UAVs um, in uh, development environments and have a lot of experience, but they're pr prior primarily using proprietary systems right now. Um, and so getting beyond that, and there's other aspects to, of our technology that are also proprietary, such as GPS, that we haven't gotten away from either, uh, but just ways that we can approach that. And also, you know, we really want to be, be able to have good ways that we can leave UAVs with communities so they're able to fix them and depend on them and all those things that everyone else was uh, talking about with technology as well. But we certainly are interested in it. I mean, I'd say that I mean, I've, I've crashed Agile Pilot before as well. I just thought I'd put that in. <laughs> <laughs> um, literally, got the, the UAV that I would in it. The basic use for, I mean, like the type of which Kate's mentioned, um, like data in the event of emergencies or even for preparation or um, resiliency before an emergency, which I think there's a lot of um, untapped application for, for drones. Where I'm kind of excited about as a, I guess, say, at the top for um, uh, unmanned cargo drones or for the ability to actually airlift in large quantities of supplies with a uh, safety record that's even now I think probably just slightly better than the um, legion of drunk Russian pilots that we seem to employ to, to do a lot of that flying. Have you been in touch at all with Mark Jacobson and his project doing that in Syria? Uh, no. Into Syria? No. I'm, like I might have to... Mark that, that's the... It's hard whether that's going to be up to that same sort of level of. He's trying to build a. Mm. He wants to send 10,000 drones into Syria dropping any medication. Um, mm -hmm. So he's got quite a large scale of effort going on. Um, and I'm trying to help him out on the autopilot side to do the appropriate software. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's interested in things like avoiding air defense systems. Yeah, right. Um, which would be a problem, you know. One of, one of the areas, I mean, which is, I'm not entirely sure for, for drones, but it's one that can also be filled um, with balloons or kites, is, um, and there's a slight overlap with the military, but as humanitarian workers continue to operate in insecure, and I like to say continue, have been for... Ways for, again, 
but it's like um, or area denial is is not so much it, but to be able to um, be able to rapidly survey areas and have I guess an over an, an understanding or an operating picture of what is going on in a given area um, can add considerably to the to the safety and security of of NGO staff that are operating in environments like Syria, where there's a high lawlessness and where kidnapping is probably one of the most serious threats that people face there. But having that sort of eye in the sky, uh, I think, is an area that I think a, few, a lot of NGOs would probably be very um, hesitant to to start uh, moving area so much because of the, the military implications, but I think that considering the growing insecurity that uh, that organisations face, that we need to consider these types of, of tools. <clears throat> so it's interesting we we're talking about this over over lunch, and with fear of being a bit of a luddite, I'm I'm sort of a bit like, oh no, not not drones. Um, and I, I think I've got a, a couple of a couple of sort of things that I think cautions around, and this I've had this conversation with others, is around drones in this context. And I think one of the first ones is is this the right solution or is this just the the cool solution? And I think it's been really needing to to clarify that. I mean, I'm sure there there, there are use cases, but making sure that this is the appropriate solution, not just, I mean, don't get me wrong, drones are freaking awesome, but are they the right tool here? And it's a, it's a very sexy solution, but some of the problems are really not that sexy and not that interesting, and, and some of those are, are more are easier to solve and you get more value out of it. The other one is a sort of a more of a sort of philosophical thing, and I think it really it's important that the drones empower communities and that drones aren't used as a sort of a way to impose humanitarian relief over people. Um, the drones, you can just have humanitarian relief without even having to talk to the affected communities. Um, and I think that's a really, we should be, in the work that we should be doing, we should be looking at how we empower communities, not just fly things over and drop things on. And one of the challenges there is that in a lot of the affected communities, especially in conflicts, drones do fly things and drop bombs on them. So, yeah, so drones are scary. So, and it's... You, you move into that whole sort of the crossover between humanitarianism and the military, um, and there's, there's intersection. I mean, a lot of military's assets are used in humanitarianism. There's a crossover there. So there's a lot, of, a lot of cautions. I mean, but how do you make drones less scary, and how do you make sure in doing that you're not making people vulnerable to drones that are scary? So just some thoughts. One thing I was going to mention that I think is important with the open source use of drones, though, is that you can build them with the community in a way that you can't with the um, most proprietary solutions in a way that if there's ownership of them and they've been built, they can be less scary, I think. Any... Oh. And I think one of the things there is where is that data going from... Those drones. I mean, the data. If it's owned by the community, they're there looking at their community. It's not some some white person from afar looking at their community, which I think is somewhat disempowering. Any other questions? Um, I had a question, uh, I guess, um, for Noel, or uh, really about Noel's talk. Like, like here? Um, yeah, like obviously you're like critical of um, overt land grabs and stuff like that, but it still seems to me like, um, you know, even going in with the best intentions, there's still a possibility that by, you know, demarcating people's land like this and bringing in all your technology for measuring it, that you can still be like, imposing a system of, of private property in areas where it's not, not necessarily yet dominant. Because um, obviously there's, there's concerns that, particularly with organisations like the World Bank, in the wake of disasters, reforms can be imposed on people that aren't necessarily wanted. Um, so without wanting to come at it from too critical a perspective, I was wondering kind of how you'd fit those concerns into, into your framework. No, that's a, a, a great point, and it's, it probably didn't come through strongly enough in the talk. We're not about trying to impose private property models. Uh, what we want is something that's flexible enough to actually work with the communities to look at how they're handling tenure as well. So it's that social tenure relationship, not necessarily 
the traditional formal land tenure system that you'll see in you know, a developed economy like in New Zealand or Australia. So it's giving the, the NGOs or community groups or communities themselves the ability to go out and map their own lands, could necessarily be just community boundary, not individual plots, so they can start managing their own resources better as well. And it's through that that they can also monitor the use of their own lands also. No, no, I'm just, <laughs> um, just um, follow on um, Michael's talk on um, how the open source model is a bit different from the human humanitarian um, missions, where there are a lot of users who are not actually contributing back to the code base. Um, say um, myself, I've been um, in deployment of um, a software called Geo Network, where it's a kind of a map de repository kind of thing there are lots of um, diverse focuses for different groups. Um, is there any efforts in um, like how developers actually talk to those users and seeing what they need? And also, like, is, is there any effort in convincing the users to contribute their, their useful customization back to the code base themselves? Yes. <laughs> 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 um, but I'll have to dig deeper. Um, so, I mean, one of the things we've done in Sahana, which I think is really good, is we have different templates. So everything I showed you was different templates. Um, and all of those templates live inside the code base. Um, which is sometimes challenging working for big organizations which don't understand open source and we're like, we want to make everything we do for you open source and sometimes we just do that and haven't had to beg forgiveness at all. Um, I think really the contribution that users make um, is sort of the requirements. We, we do encourage users to con contribute to our wiki. I think it is a big challenge is to, is to create a, a community which really um, motivates and, and encourages technical people to get in, engaged and, and to also and to have those technical discussions that you need to have in open source projects, but also enables users to um, participate. And I think one of the challenges we face is I think we're very technically dominated and so we need to create uh, and one of the things I'm hoping to work towards is create forums where users can come and participate and not feel technically intimidated and looking at different modes for that is our mailing lists the right way to do that our in-person meetings um, conference calls a better approach to that um, but I think yeah I mean we've got all of these different templates in, in, our, in our core trunk code um, and one of what we're what we're wanting to do this year is is to look at what other I think I said before like how can we f find the similarities between those and and talk to different user groups and say you're doing something like this you're doing something like ninety percent the same can we just make these things the same and and uh, improve standardization does that answer your question yeah For the work that I do with Geo Network, we are facing kind of similar thing, where um, there's so much customization going on for each of the deployment that basically what they do is they just grab our base system and modify it into Oblivion, and then if we go to the next version, they need to do all of them again because it's so so much had modified, been modified. It, it helps that we have a small team, so it's usually the same team that's that's doing that. We our team is committed to the trunk, yep. so so I mean we still have our base and then what, what exists yep. in the templates. So we're trying to invest as much in the trunk as possible instead of in customizations, yep. um, and it's just it's also it's a, it's a funding challenge because you often get yes. funding for deployments, but not yes. to maintain the trunk. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so. Um, we're looking for funding at the moment, if anyone has any. <laughs> Thank you. I was going to mention, I'm part of a project called InnoSafe, which does impact modeling. So your scientific hazard model, like your tsunami or your earthquake, and you combine that with base infrastructure data, such as population information or roads or buildings. And... It's, uh, it started primarily in Indonesia, and Cartoza is an open source software development company um, that 
Tim Sutton, if you know him, is involved in. And what he's been doing is every time he comes to Indonesia, he partners with the local Python meetup group. The Python meetup group, I would say only about half the people that attend know Python. So a lot of people want to learn. It's not a language taught in universities for the most part in Indonesia. So um, he divides them into groups, you know, people who don't have an IDE installed, people who know a little bit of Python, and people who are ready to work on InnoSafe, because um, usually he has a couple other developers with him as well. So the goal is to help develop and foster that software development. And he does hire people from that as well. So it's also potentially a job opportunity. And um, and so part of that has been uh, trying to get everyone to contribute to core, essentially. Uh, and part of it also is InnoSafe is very small. There's a couple specific funders. And um, the expectation is that you're contributing uh, features to the core uh, software. One of the things we're struggling with is, ha as we grow, how do we still manage to do that as well? Um, if you look at GeoNode, which started in a similar way to InnoSafe, there's actually quite a few organizations involved now. And while there are customizations, uh, the organizations seem to take turns funding things. So instead of everyone writing a proposal to add a specific feature, um, one group says, OK, we're going to work on this feature um, to avoid some duplication. ask a question? Okay, I'm going to ask one then. Uh, so we all talked about, a little, touched a little bit about being involved. Um, would you, um, what's the best way to get involved with your individual projects? And for you, Chris, if people thought the humanitarian roadie uh, work seemed cool, what's the best way to get started with that? Um, I don't know, my own personal story is a bit weird. I, I sometimes tell people I, I kind of fell into it, um, that I didn't have anything else better to do. But that that's kind of glossing over. Um, that if people are interested in the in the field of humanitarian logistics, it's a very, very broad field. It does have quite a, a lot of IT. Uh, as I said, I worked as a GIS operator and uh, web developer before I went to work for um, Doctors Without Borders as a logistician. I might have skipped over that I was in the Army as well for a few years, which taught me things like how to maintain batteries and drive tanks, um, which aren't necessarily skills that are in high demand. Um, but um, uh, certainly if anybody is interested in it, I strongly encourage people to simply uh, inquire with the agency that um, they find the work that they do the most attractive. I certainly know that organisations like Doctors Without Borders Adelaide and, uh, and other parts of uh, Australasia. Um, but if picking up the phone and giving them a call is the, is the way to find out um, how best to, to get the process started, um, but certainly uh, volunteering and um, being more engaged, I guess, with those organisations beforehand is an asset. Um, so best to, to find out from them what they're looking for at the time. I think Red Cross also do recruitment. Yeah, the, most, of the, most of the major NGOs do. Uh, and that's basically, I mean, it's, it's, people ask me this question all the time, and unfortunately my answer tends to be to pick up the phone and ask them what they're looking for. Well, as a, as a startup, we've got a couple of different streams uh, coming down the pipe, I suppose. We're obviously going to be hiring ourselves internally over the, the coming months, but also because we are going to be piggybacking um, and utilising what others are doing, you know, I'd encourage people to look at the likes of Ushahidi and OpenStreetMap and the communities of developers around that and how they're contributing to the core, because they're the sorts of models that we're going to follow, as well as some of the platforms that are out there. So there are a lot of open source tools that we'll look to leverage. We're not going to try and reinvent the wheel by any stretch. And if people come on board with our community and they have those skills, then it brings great value to what we want to do and help expedite our uh, journey to get rolling quicker as well. So right now, have you got me? 
to you as an audience, just come and have a chat with me. Um, we've got a lot of information online about how to contribute, um, how to get involved, um, which you can look through. But because we're in, here in person, um, I can give you a much more rich and customised um, answer if any of you are interested. I mean, broadly speaking, um, we do try and we try and be an open open source community. So there's bug lists that people can get involved in, instructions on how to install our software. Um, we've actually got a, a, a position open in Bangkok if anyone wants to head over to Thailand and work on Sahana over there at the moment. Um, so yeah, um, but yeah, there's information on our, on our um, wiki, but I, I can have a much more detailed conversation with any of you one-on-one -on -one if you'd like. Kate, did you want to... Sorry, just one comment. Um, one thing you said, I've just talked to Kate before, and um, I found that because I actually um, lecture in GIS here in the University of Auckland, and over time, I saw a lot of students who are interested in humanitarian um, aspects of GIS, but they've never been able to find a way to get into it, say, from, from Auckland. And they don't know who to talk to. And when they just send an email to, say, a general email address to, say, the Red Cross, they will say, like, we will come back to you once we know some information, and they never come back. So. Yeah, it would, I would say that it would be good if like, you guys could actually um, go to, say, universities or lectures for like, GIS or geography or something that's related and talk to those students. And th that way you would like, be able to get a lot of people who are interested. One thing, one challenge that at least I face in the Sahana community is there's lots of interest, but what we really want is commitment. And we do spend a lot of time talking to people who are interested and, and introducing the project. And, and I think that's an important thing that we need to do. Is what, what, what I really look for is someone who says, found your web, found Sahana, struggled through the documentation. Actually, it's not that hard. We've done a lot of work to, to improve it. Installed it, solved a bug. Like, and someone who's really invested a lot. Um, I mean, my own path into humanitarian work, I, I, after the tsunami, I tried emailing, no response, um, and I went there. I, I don't know if I necessarily encourage that, especially in the changing face of humanitarian action, and, and it's a lot, like, a lot of the major disasters are, are major security um, hazards as well. Um, but I think just showing that commitment, putting that personal commitment in, um, makes you more attractive to those organisations. And also, picking up the phone, as Chris said, is more effective than emailing sometimes. Yeah, I did want to add a, a little addendum to that. And I think it's uh, an interesting point, which is is that um, organisations, uh, the big organisations, can be very vertical in the types of <clears throat> profiles of people that they're looking for, and very field-focused in the sense of either a logistician, nurse, nutritional advisor, they're very clear in the very vertical roles and some of them are, are, they are what the organisation was founded on doing. Some of the more, um, I guess you'd say horizontal or um, slightly out of the box uh, sort of things like digital, like GIS. GIS, although it's not new technology, the application of it in humanitarian circles is still very new and there's very very few, a very um, small number of organisations that actually have their own GIS ca uh, capacity in house, and um, it, it doesn't surprise me that if, and if, not just GIS, but um, a whole range of other more horizontal fields, if you were just to email the info at uh, address on the website, or even talk to somebody necessarily in the call centre, you're going to get a, a check and, a, and a, somebody will call you back, and that might not happen. Um, but I would highly encourage, um, like I, I found it quite interesting to come more into contact with the GIS resources um, at Doctors Without Borders, an organisation of which I'm, I've worked for, I'm a member of, I've been a board member of, through mapping with HOT um, than I did through my own organisation. It, um, it seemed to be far more broadly publicised um, outside of the organisation than inside. And I would imagine that this is very similar with other tech projects, that if you're wanting to get involved in humanitarian tech, then maybe the sideways approach of volunteering and been committed to uh, a, a tech project um, that's in collaboration with other with the big organisations um, would be a far more s a direct way of getting in touch with the people in that in those organisations that are trying to marshal the resources the tech resources um, rather than just the 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 info or um, phone number or email address. Twitter would probably be. A good
to engage with those people as well. <laughs> and uh, one thing I was going to say, I think also with the software project, sometimes it's easier to get in. So Hot, for example, we're a small organization with 15 staff. And I had an intern live with me for six months in Jakarta. And it was just because she seemed really committed and really interested. And I had an extra bedroom. And a large organization isn't going to be able to do something that casual, probably. Uh, but the way to get involved with us is first by mapping. We get a lot of emails of people who want to go off and do field work somewhere. And we have more people than we have projects at the moment for that sort of thing. Uh, but we pull from our volunteers when we make those decisions as well. So that's a great way for people to get involved. Um, and as I mentioned to you, within OpenStreetMap, there's an initiative called Teach OSM, which is in, uh, aimed to get universities better involved. Uh, and HOT is involved with that, but it's also the broader OpenStreetMap community. Uh, Sahana and OpenStreetMap also participate in Google Summer of Code. So it's a good way for um, students to get involved with paid internships. Uh, HOT has two interns with the GNOME outreach program as well at the moment, and I'm hoping we'll do that again as well. Because um, those are, I think it's also important, we talk a lot about volunteers, but it's also important that people need to eat and they need to pay their bills and all of those sorts of things. And so having both types of opportunities for people as well. Does the panel have any questions for each other or the audience? What would you, I, I can ask another question. Um, so uh, what do you think your, uh, the challenge that most first comes up when someone says, what are your challenges within your organization or what you're trying to, your mission and what you're trying to accomplish? We'll just go down the line. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we have obvious challenges as a startup, and we have many of them. But uh, in terms of our sectoral challenges, I guess um, we're working in a sphere where there is you know, long-held traditions within government that we're trying to break down as well. So, um, you know, we talked about ineffective land administration systems that ex in exist right now, or ones that don't exist. When we try and, and get into governments, there's a lot of rent-seeking that goes on, as I mentioned with the corruption angle, but there's a lot of protection or self-interest that goes on about protecting their own jobs. Um, you know, one of the places I worked on, uh, was it mid-2000s, was Zambia, and I went in there with the good intentions of helping streamline transaction processes within the Ministry of Lands and putting a new land information system in. Well, I found out that it was the land information uh, management staff who were running an open source system and they were you know, espousing the virtues of that. But at the same time, they were identifying the vacant land parcels around the, the city outskirts and either selling those off or uh, putting their own families' names down. Um, you know, a couple of those got caught out and, and sent away, but you can't underestimate the, the people challenges that you're going to face. You know, as we've heard, tech is just one piece of it. You know, if it's 10% or if it's 20 a lot more comes down to what is happening around in that sector. And it comes back also to how do you get into the sector? Yes, focusing on the technical aspects of, of what we do individually as organisations or collectively in terms of developing solutions, but thinking beyond that. You know, from, from my point of view, what are some of the, the greater challenges of crowdsourcing data and putting it up on the web? not from a technical standpoint, but what are the, the security aspects, the transparency aspects? How do I mitigate or de deal with unintended circumstances? So those are you know, certainly some of the big questions that we're facing. Um, it seems that getting the finance part was easier than what those are actually going to be. And, and I think you know, building that community around what we're doing as a platform and having people understand who are not necessarily in that sector. You know, I think the diagram that showed that split of contributors and users is going to be quite important to us because that's really what's going to affect us. We'll have a lot of people that I think will contribute to the code and, and the platform, but they won't be the end users. 
So how do we bridge that gap and build capacity within the local users as well so you know, we, we get more crossover? Yeah, and I would say that's one of our big challenges is, is diverse groups of stakeholders. Um, you've got your 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 co contributors, your your documentation contributors, your design contributors. Um, how do you get all of them talking together? Which is sort of, and then you've got very different um, users who, I mean, I didn't sort of, I don't think I mentioned in my talk. I mean, when I first started working for an NGO in Indonesia, there was huge cultural differences, and it wasn't between sort of the me as a westerner and the and the and the local indonesians it was more between me coming from a very sort of technology focus um to a working for an for an ngo and i i sort of say it's coming from a world of black and white to to a world of 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 of, of, gray, of shades of gray it's it's uh, different mentalities and and th things work in different different ways so it's bridging those different stakeholder groups i mean it's looking at how do you engage them all in a way and empower them all in a way so you don't have sort of your developers who feel that they're just being sort of told what to do by sort of expert users who don't really understand so it's how how to um bring those all together the other the other thing we we face at the moment i've i'm sort of as i said i'm, I'm relatively new in, in the role sahana has been around for a long time but it's sort of as a foundation, the foundation hasn't really been very active in the past um, sort of five years, and so my challenge is really to to invigorate the foundation and look for funding to to help support that. So that's one of the challenges I face. Uh, I mean, I think just from the broader uh, adoption of or integration of tech into humanitarian, um, I think the the single biggest thing I've seen at that end when addressing the much greatly outsized circle of the end user as opposed to the contributor is language, both concrete language that people speak uh, and also the meta language of computer interfaces. A great disparity in the people that we employ in people who either speak both languages come at a, have a, a much clearer advantage over other people in their communities in terms of their access to that employment. And how we bridge that gap, first there's that Computer interfaces are becoming better, touchscreen technology is becoming more pervasive, so people are becoming much more accustomed to it. But I think there's a, a the bigger challenge of that, as much as English may be the, the global language, not everybody speaks it at a, at a function, at a level that's functional. So I think that that's a, a challenge for all developers to consider in, in both the, the user experience and also in how they make it internationalized on if that's a word. I know for us, one of the big problems is um, long-term sustainability of the types of projects we work on. A lot of times people want to fund us to map a city as quickly as possible. And then, of course, the data goes gets out of, out of date. You can't build a community of any sort in two or three months. Um, if you, our most successful project to date has been in Indonesia, and I lived there for three years. I just moved away six months ago. Um, so we've been there for almost four years now, and we have a local staff and a local office uh, versus some of the other places we've worked just for a couple weeks. Um, there isn't really a community. One or two people might be really interested, in, interested, but they don't really have enough support. So in when we're doing paid programs and paid work, it's thinking about how it accomplishes our broader goals rather than a very short-term um, exercise. Any other questions from the group? Sorry if this has been asked before, it just came in. Um, in terms of how the hardship getting people to create a community and things like that. Have you considered using, tapping into an existing community to do the maps? Say, for example, um, maybe the local scouts or girl guides, you know, as part of their, because they do some sort of ma mapping, tracking thing that they might actually use that as a um, learning tool or something. We do. Uh, I find, um Sometimes it takes time to find that local community, uh, and it, who that community is really 
really vary, can vary from country to country. We've worked with scouts before, uh, and one of the key things for working with them it was simply having a couple of scout leaders that were really interested. Uh, sometimes we work with civil society groups um, as well, and one of the main things that we've discovered works is finding groups that need maps, but maybe are doing them in really inefficient ways, and then saying, hey, we'll help you do this mapping better. And so they were going to make maps anyway, so we showed them a, a way that might be more effective. Um, but it does seem to really, it just really varies country to country. Uh, for example, in Indonesia, we share an office with Wikimedia Indonesia, and we have a very close partnership. Our um, Indonesian staff actually technically work for Wikimedia Indonesia. But then in the Philippines, there's actually a much stronger OpenStreetMap community than Wikipedia community. So we work closely with the OpenStreetMap community. And it really varies country to country. Um, and so we definitely look for those communities, but sometimes it takes some time to find them and figure out who they are. Thanks. Um, if you could go back, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years, what are the big, I don't know, can, can you name like a single design decision you would have changed about some of the systems you're encountering? This isn't really a design decision, but we've talked a lot about naming, for example. So the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. So humanitarian response is very different than international development. And so in the first couple of years, we essentially wanted to do disaster preparedness, which is international development. But convincing people that we did international development with the word humanitarian in our name was difficult. Uh, so I don't know what I would call us instead. It's too late now. Um, but thinking about those, those sorts of things. Uh, as far as decisions, it's difficult with what we do because we are on top of OpenStreetMap. And OpenStreetMap made some very deliberate, non-traditional mapping decisions uh, ten, 10 years ago, uh, which I think actually hold true as being good decisions, but they make it difficult to hook into traditional mapping. Uh, for example, the OpenStreetMap tagging system uses key value pairs instead of a traditional tabular database structure, which does not fit well into traditional systems. Uh, so what we've ended up doing is building tools around them. Um, but in building those tools around them, I guess the design decision those was we should have thought a lot more about the interface and who we worked with to build those interfaces. Because we have a couple where they do amazing things, but no one can figure out how to use them. So that human-computer interaction, I don't think we've given that enough thought all the time. Um, I would say from limited software tools that I've used over the last 15 years, I think it's probably a common thing that developers would know, but um, there's a tendency to design for the systems that people will have next year or the year after next, rather than the one that they've been working with for the last three years. And why is it taking half an hour for this access database to just show one single drop-down menu? Um, so I think that's probably something that everybody who's a developer is familiar with, but I can't emphasize it enough in, in developing for humanitarian tech. It's got to work on the systems from three or four years ago, not for the ones that are going to be released next month. And I don't mean to offend any developers in the room, but I guess the, the biggest design decision that we would have changed from my, the previous company was that we had developers designing the interface. Um, <laughs> And I think, you know, that holds true these days with the, the focus on UX, UI and getting that up front, that experience. Um, you know, developers have a very different mindset and it's a completely different language to the UX, UI working with the end users. And uh, we didn't pay enough attention to that. And I guess we would have been much more modular in the design uh, that we deployed as well rather than hard coding everything into a large big enterprise system which made customization for... for that much more difficult. Of course, we could charge more for it, but uh, it gave us a hell of a lot of time trying to you know, work with distributed teams on development as well. Yeah, I would say build, build less, design more. I think we're, we're often too eager to, to, to code a solution without really knowing what the problem 
we're trying to solve is and, and to really confirm that that's a problem. Um, to investigate the problem in all angles, figure out who the stakeholders are, who, who the solution, I'm not quite sure what's, who's going to use the solution. Um, one other... Me. Uh, one other thing I would say is maybe um, I think we maybe have overstructured our data model a bit. I think we could have potentially used a simpler data model which gave more flexibility to the users in terms of what they put in different field uh, in different different tables um, and just instead of trying to guess what the data they're going to be managing is, make up a bunch of field names and then find out that actually when they start using it, half that is blank and they're using it for something else. So more unstructured data and then responding to what the, the users use, use it for. That actually, I worked on a, reminded me of a design decision I made once that was bad, was attempting to replace Excel uh, unsuccessfully. So, um, I did. Uh, and, and part of that is just being careful and figuring out how you're going to replace things. For example, we're working on a flood reporting application that hopefully will be used by the Jakarta government, but I have no expectation for everyone to be using that for reporting this year. We're hoping to replace some faxes and some SMS and some phone calls this year, just some. You know, it, it'll take years for adoption, but getting anyone to use it is the first goal. So that's actually it for us on time. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to approach all of us. I know that uh, myself, Noel, and Michael will be around this week. Um, Chris is just attending today, but he'll, he'll also be at the Penguin dinner if you have any questions. Thank you for uh, attending the first uh, open source humanitarian mini-conf at LCA.